Hello everyone. Welcome to another interesting and informative session of the analyst. In today's video we are going to discuss in detail about five important topics from the perspective of the UPSC examination as featured in the Hindu and Indian Express. The topics are as follows. First of all we will inquire about the issues being faced by Asha workers leading to their protest. After that we will study about the issue of landfills and associated waste management in our country. Then we will read about the details of Kiru Hydel project often seen in the news which will be followed by a detailed study of Interpol and various kind of notices issued by the organization towards the end we will have a quick overlook about a disease which is about to be eradicated from the world named as gunia worm disease the handout for the discussion will be available in the description of the video for your revision so let's begin the asha workers have been in the news because they have been protesting to raise their issues in front of various state as well as central government the asha workers which forms the backbone of our primary healthcare system and thus the issues associated with them and its idol solution forms an important component of your gs2 paper under the theme of welfare schemes and government policies and interventions before we dwell into the issues which are affecting the asha workers let's first try to understand who are asha workers the accredited social health activist or asha program was launched in the year 2005 6 under the national rural health mission and it was further extended to urban areas in the year of 2013 under national urban health mission this asha program drew its inspiration from alma ata declaration on primary health care which took place in the year 1978 and more majorly from the mitani initiative of chatisgarh government which took place in the year 2002 the mitani here stands for a friend a female friend and the initiative aim to provide volunteers for primary health care thus asha workers forms the first point of contact to cater health related requirement of deprived section which is majorly constitutes of women and children who do not have adequate access to public health care these asha workers under the guideline laid down by national health mission are preferably between the age of 25 to 45 years and poses basic literacy skills now under the new guidelines the preference is given to a worker who has studied till class 10th or above but there can be relaxation in this criteria if we are talking in the region of hilly areas or tribal areas at the same time the norm is one asha per 1000 people but at the same time the relaxation is provided in tribal and hilly regions where it can be one asha worker per one community thus making it the world's largest community healthcare program because as per the data available for june 2022 there are more than 10.5 lakh asha workers in our country now one may be curious that what are the services which are provided by these asha workers thus the services provided by the asha workers are just look at the spoke wheel model at your screen also keep this in mind that such a spoke wheel model can be used in your mains answer to enhance the visibility of your answer 
Thus, the services which are provided by these ASHA workers are promotion of nutrition, sanitation and hygiene. For example, promoting the construction of toilets under Swach Bharat Abhiyan. Then, they also promote healthy living and working condition. For example, these ASHA workers provide nominal health care services such as tablets for fever or diarrhea etc in the rural health setup. Also, they create awareness about the existing health services such as Pradhan Mantri Jan Arog Yojana or sensitizing the public about the spread of any disease such as COVID under National Disease Control Program. At the same time, they encourage the women to give institutional birth under safe condition in hospitals. For example, under Janani Suraksha Yojana, these ASHA workers provide various kind of services such as identification of pregnant women, prenatal care, also making sure their safe institutional delivery by registered doctors, at the same time providing vaccine to the infant under immunization program. Also, these ASHA workers provide basic essential medical provisions in the rural healthcare setup such as providing ORS, iron folic acid tablets or oral pills and condoms for better family planning. With this limited knowledge, let's try to solve a prelims question which appeared in the year 2012. The question states that with reference to the National Rural Health Mission 2005-06 under which the ASHA program was initiated, which of the following are the jobs of the ASHA workers? The first option says accompanying women to health facility for antenatal care checkup, which is correct using the pregnancy test kit for detection of pregnancy that is correct providing information on nutrition and immunization again it is correct the fourth statement says conducting the delivery of the baby as we discussed earlier such delivery of the baby can be only be done by a registered doctor and not asha workers they only make sure to promote institutional delivery among the rural women Thus, we can eliminate the option 4 and get to our answer A. Moving forward, these ASHA workers who are considered as the foot soldier of rural healthcare system, they are being deprived of their basic human rights because of various issues which are faced by them. So, let's try to understand that the healthcare services in rural areas are ensured by three A's. The three A's are auxiliary, midwife, nurse or anganwadi or asha workers. Out of these three, only two are recognized as government jobs under various acts of the government and get fixed salary. On the other hand, these asha workers are not recognized as government workers. Rather, they are hold honorary or volunteering position and thus they do not get any fixed salary. They are not having a government job as per the statute. Thus, they get performance based incentives under various initiatives of the government such as immunization program or referral services for reproductive child health care program or construction of household toilets under Swach Bharat Abhiyan. This provision of not providing them any fixed salary leads to their poor financial condition. As we can see in the state of Madhya Pradesh, the family monthly income of an ASHA worker is stands at as meager as from 5,000 to 15,000 rupees. 
at the same time they have no opportunities for career progression because the individual performance of these asha workers cannot be calculated which leads to there is no system for promotion of them and there is huge dependency of these asha workers on the incentives which are provided by the state health department which obviously leads to their dissatisfaction and poor performance because their thankless job is neither being recognized nor being compensated all these financial issues are further aggravated by the issue of triple burden where these asha workers are supposed to play dual role as a homemaker and as a working woman at the community health centers over and above which being the part of the community they faces a lot of discrimination such as on the lines of gender caste and informal economy let's discuss each aspect one by one the first is their role as homemaker now keep this in mind that these asha workers who are providing these essential health services in the rural area they are also homemakers where they perform important duties of cooking food at the home washing the utensils and nursing the child at the same time they also have to go and work in the rural healthcare setup for meager salaries this according to world bank leads to time poverty where these women are deprived of self health care thus leading to poor nutrition at the same time also a lack of sleep and getting affected by various kind of non communicable diseases for example as per national family health survey 5 india has the highest burden of anemia in the world with more than 50% indian women are anemic now what is anemia anemia is basically a disease where there is lack of healthy red blood cells and this take place because of deficiency of iron iodine folic acid etc also because they are playing this dual role they also it also leads to a lot of conflict at their home with their spouses or their in-laws to over and above this they faces a grave issue of caste discrimination now historically these asha workers come from the marginalized section of the society and when they go to work at a rural setup which is dominated by caste hierarchies they faces various kind of social taboos and discrimination for example there are several instances where these asha workers were not allowed to enter into the house or if allowed they were made to sit at the ground and make a certain distance from the high caste women an issue which is sophistically termed as double tumbler system also these asha workers faces various kinds of gender based disrespect because they are working with panchayati raj institutions or rural health care system which is majorly dominated by the male section thus they face a lot of stigmas for example let's say that there is an asha worker which is working in a patriarchal rural setup and is trying to create awareness about family planning and reproductive health in a in men's there so obviously it can lead to a lot of stigmas associated with these asha workers also there is issue of unavailability of facilities where these asha workers lack the basic medical equipments at the same time they have to burn all the out of pocket expenditure from their salary or incentive which they get from state health department
Thus, their logistic cost itself forms a major portion of their salary. For example, as per a study in Bhopal, this logistic cost amounted to 63% of their income. At the same time, they, these ASHA workers serve in the conflict-prone regions such as the regions affected by left-wing extremism or ethnic violence affected regions where these ASHA workers can be exposed to various kinds of violence and social stigma. Also, because after the COVID took place, there is increasing work burden on these ASHA workers because under the COVID and vaccination program, they provided various kind of services such as checking for symptoms, helping people in quarantine centers or providing medicine and pulse oximeters and as well as helping in the vaccination drive. And for this thankless service of theirs, what they got in return was social stigma. Because we all can recall those videos during the COVID-19 time because where the stones were hurled on these ASHA workers as well as they were stigmatized as carrier of viruses. Thus, Taking the cognizance of these grave issues which are surrounding ASHA workers, there are several positive steps which has been taken recently. For example, in the year 2018, the Health Ministry extended the insurance coverage for accident, death and disability to these ASHA workers. Also, the thankless service provided by these ASHA workers during the COVID-19 period was advocately recognized by WHO or World Health Organization, which provided them the Global Health Leaders Award 2022. As recently as the interim budget 2024, the government has finally decided to provide free health insurance for all ASHA and Anganwadi workers under the Pradhan Mantri Ayushman Bharat scheme, which aims to provide 5 lakh insurance coverage for families. Now keep this in your conscience that the article 47 of the constitution directs the state to improve public health. To achieve which these ASHA workers are a critical component. Thus their adequate remuneration shall be ensured. At the same time we should strive for their capacity building and incentivizing them for their thankless service. With this suggestion, we move forward to the next news of the day. The landfill and waste management has been in the news because of rising concerns related to the poor management of landfills and solid waste management in our country which forms an important component of your GS3 paper under the theme of environment pollution and degradation. So before we inquire the issue associated with this solid waste management, let's first try to inquire the status of landfill and waste generation in our country. As we have the 18% population of the world being the most populous country in the world as per United Nations report, India generates 190 million tons of waste per year and approximately 1.5 lakh tons of garbage daily, which comprises of 12% of the global municipal waste out of which only 70% is collected, 20% is treated and approximately 50% is dumped in various landfills across the country. As per CPCB or Central Pollution Control Board, the municipal solid waste generation is further going to increase up to 250 million tons by 2030. What is the impact of this landfill and waste generation in our country is what we are going to come to a bit further. But let's first try to understand why there is this issue of landfill and waste generation in our country. What are the causes? 
द फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट इज द पुअर इंप्लीमेंटेशन ऑफ रेगुलेटरी मैकेनिजम्स विच वर डिवाइज फॉर द वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट इन आवर कंट्री सच एज सॉलिड वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट रूल्स 2016 एंड प्लास्टिक वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट रूल्स 2022. now obviously there is red tapeism and various bureaucratic bottlenecks but also one of the major reason for the poor implementation of these rules are the poor financial status of municipal corporations in our country which lack adequate financial resources for creation of sites where this garbage can be collected segregated at the source and then recycled also there is lack of data collection about one particular collection area that how many houses are there in this collection area and these houses are generating what amount of waste for which what kind of recycling capacity needs to be generated at the same time there is lack of scientific planning because most of these landfills are associated at the periphery of the cities or near the urban slums where there is very less technological know how to deploy efficient machinery for the recycling of the waste which we are generating leading to the issue of legacy waste or the untreated waste which is lying lying in that particular area for years which can be reflected from the table where we can see various mountains of garbages and these peaks which you are seeing are basically the height in feet also one of the major contributor is urbanization which has induced among ourselves the feeling of hyper consumerism where we are resorting to various kinds of use and throw products for example let's say we visit a shop and we purchase a packet of chips and pepsi can at the and we carry that back to our house in a polythene bag within a span of times we have created several non biodegradable waste and all this has severe impact on environment as well as human beings for example recently there are several cases of landfill fire where this solid and dry waste which is really prone to fire is causing various fire outbreaks impacting not only the environment but the people in their vicinity for example you all might be aware about the recent kochi landfill fire which took authorities 5 days to control at the same time it becomes a major source of global warming because these landfills emits a lot of gases which are harmful for the environment for example india has become the largest emitter of ch3 or methane gas is specifically from the landfills and this ch3 or methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas thus leading to various cases of global warming and creating urban heat islands also there are various environmental and health concerns because the toxins which are released from these bio uh, bio and solid waste it leads to various kinds of disease among the humans through the process of bio accumulation and bio magnification the disease such as itai itai which is caused by the overdose of cadmium or blue baby syndrome also the first contact to this waste or this legacy waste which is generating these harmful gases and toxins are none other than poor rag pickers which is obviously deteriorating their health and violating their right to dignified life and 
clean environment under article 21 of the constitution. Thus, what can be the ideal way forward and the steps which we shall take to curb this issue of landfills? The first is to implement the rules of solid waste management rules 2016, which provided for extended producer responsibility, where the manufacturer of a product needs to make sure that he is going to dispose any kind of phytosanitary or packaging waste. At the same time, the rules laid down effective criteria for segregation of waste at the source and its recycling. The rules also provide for user fees which can be charged for collection or the recycling of the waste. At the same time, the government has launched Waste to Wealth portal where we are trying to develop various kind of technologies for recycling of this solid waste, especially the plastic waste. Also, we should strive to convert this waste into the form of energy. For example, in budget 2023, the government launched Go Bardhan scheme, under which we are striving to convert organic waste into biogas. At the same time, we can deploy the recent discoveries which has taken place in biotechnology. For example, as per a recent research, E. coli bacteria can be used to degrade plastics. Also, we should incentivize such research to find such alternative not only to plastic but also to make sure that how we can degrade the plastic and remove it from the surface of the planet. At the same time, they, we can also adopt the practice of biomining. Biomining is basically the technique of extraction and segregation of minerals as well as any useful materials which we can find from the mounds of the waste. Thus, from these mounds of waste, we can extract several important minerals such as plastic, rubber, metals, textiles and glass which we can recycle and reuse. Also, several innovative projects can also be deployed such as replan project where the government is trying to create an alternative to plastic carry bags where we are mixing the treated plastic in ratio of 20% with 80% of the cotton racks, trying to create a cheap and alternative for the plastic bags which has become a major source of concern. Thus, with these steps and ideas, we can aim to solve the issue of landfills and at the same time, for effective waste management, we should try to decentralize it and at the same time to further incentivize research to find various kind of solutions for waste management. With these suggestions, we move forward to the next news of the day. The Kiru Heidel project has been repeatedly in the news, the reason being that the CBI is investing the charges of alleged corruption in the award of contract for Kiru Heidel project. This hydroelectric project forms an important component of your prelims examination under the theme of current affairs and events. So let's inquire about the specifications and details of Kiru Heidel project. The project is being developed by Chenab Valley Power Project Private Limited, which is a joint venture of National Hydroelectric Power Corporation and Jammu and Kashmir State Power Development Corporation. The project is being developed at the convergence point of the river Chenab and two streams, 
such as Singad and Beta streams. It is developed in Patharnaki and Kiru villages in Kistawar district of Jammu and Kashmir. The project is around the cost of the project is around 4287 crore rupees and the estimated date is that it will be completed by the year of 2025. Now the height of this dam which is a concrete gravity dam the height of the dam from the bed of the Chenab river is around 123 meter and it has the storage capacity of 41.5 million meter cube. At the same time, it has an underground powerhouse with four turbines which generate 624 megawatt of electricity, which has a lot of uses. For example, this project is going to provide electricity to North Indian states such as Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, UP. At the same time, it will also provide electricity to the unconnected regions of Jammu and Kashmir called as dark villages. Also, it will lead to the establishment of small scale local cottage industries and ultimately boosting the local economy. Now keep this in mind that these concrete gravity drams functions with underground turbines where the flow of river is diverted and these turbines rotate and create electricity. Also, there are several other important hydro power projects in the regions of Jammu and Kashmir. Let's inquire them quickly. There is Ratle Dam which is on the river Chenab. Then there is Salal Dam again on the river Chenab. Then there is Bagli Har project which is on the river Chenab and Dul Hasti which is again on the river Chenab. The river Chenab which originates from the region of Lahol and Ispiti in the state of Himachal Pradesh. And it is formed because of the convergence of two streams called as Chandra and Bhaga. Then it traverses the region of Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab to ultimately meet its mother river and that is Indus. Also, there are several other projects such as Pakaldul, which is on the Maru Sadar river, which is the tributary of the river Chenab. And on the river Jhelum, there are two important projects such as Kishan Ganga and Uri. With this discussion, let's also inquire several other important hydroelectric projects which is in our country from the perspective of your upcoming prelims examination. Well, which was the first hydroelectric project in India? The answer is Shivn Samudra Dam, which is on the river Kaveri and it was created in the year 1902 by M. Visves Rai. Also, the largest hydroelectric power plant in our country is Koena Dam, which generates around 1960 megawatt of electricity. And keep this in mind that Koena is a tributary of Krishna River. Also, the highest and tallest hydroelectric plant in our country is Tehri Dam. Keep this in mind that Tehri Dam has estimated potential of 2400 megawatt, which is obviously higher than Koena Dam. But currently, the largest capacity of one particular dam is Koena. This Tehri Dam is located on Bhagirathi River in the state of Uttarakhand. Another interesting fact, Uttarakhand is the state in our country which has the highest number of hydroelectric projects. Then the biggest underground project is Natfa Jhakri which is on the river Satlaj. And the world's second largest concrete dam is Sardar Sarovar Dam which is built on Narmada River. 
Now a curious mind may ask that if it is the world's second largest concrete dam, which is the world's largest concrete dam? The world's largest concrete dam is Three Georges Dam, which is located on Yangtze River in China. And which is the world's first hydroelectric plant? It was built in Wisconsin in USA. With these interesting informations, let's move forward to the next news of the day. The Interpol has been in the news because there are various concerns which has been raised about the misuse of Interpol's police system especially the issuance of blue corner notices. This forms an important component of your GS2 paper under the theme of important international institutions. Let's first try to understand what is Interpol and then we will come to what are the notices issued by the Interpol. Well, Interpol or International Criminal Police Organization was created in the year 1923 to collect and disseminate information from police forces around the world to facilitate and ease the criminal investigation. India joined Interpol in the year of 1956 and currently Interpol has 196 members. The headquarter of Interpol lies at Lyon, France. And the functions of the Interpol is regulated by a governing body which is General Assembly. This General Assembly meets once annually and an interesting fact here is that in the year 2022, India hosted the General Assembly of Interpol. This assembly is presided by a president who is elected for four-year terms. Now, every country has a particular agency which coordinates the criminal investigation on the lines of Interpol and share the information to Interpol. In our country, that nodal agency is Central Bureau of Investigation. As we discuss that these agencies can investigate any criminal, let's say that there is a country A which is USA and USA directs India to investigate a citizen of India or a resident of India for some criminal charges. Then that investigation will be transferred or this message will be transferred to India by Interpol and the nodal agency here will be Central Bureau of Investigation. And all this information will be available on a platform called as I-24 by 7, which is an encrypted, internet-based, worldwide communication network, where any agency such as CBI can access any data about a criminal anywhere in the world and can also communicate with other agencies around the world any time of the day. Now, for, to facilitate these criminal investigations and exchange of informations, there are several kind of notices which are issued by Interpol, amounting majorly to seven, and an eighth notice is issued by Interpol on the request of United Nations Security Council. Such notices can be for a particular kind of investigation related to a criminal. For example, the yellow notice is released to locate a missing person. Or the black notice is released to seek information on unidentified bodies. Or the purple notice is released to seek information on a person or object which are being used by the criminals. From our examination perspective, two notices are important. The first is red notice and the second is blue notice. 
so let's read in a bit detail about them the blue corner notice is an inquiry notice released by the interpol which is issued prior to the filing of criminal charges which means that the crime has still not been proven that is why it is not falling in the category of red corner notice it is a blue corner notice where it allows the police force to share any critical crime related information such as obtaining the person's criminal record or the location of that particular person or the verification of the identity of that person because he might be in disguise and traveling across the country for example the blue corner notice was released for an indian fugitive named as nityanand so what is red corner notice red corner notice is issued by a member state of interpol where the notice says about the arrest of a wanted criminal through extradition or any other lawful action and this red corner notice is issued against a person wanted by national jurisdiction or for prosecution which means that the charges has been filed and has been proved for example this red corner notice was issued for nirav modi in his association with punjab national bank scam such notice can have a lot of repercussion for the subject involved for example his tra his traveling can be banned or he can be arrested in any particular country at the same time his bank accounts can also be confiscated and seized keep a very important thing in your mind here that such red corner notice is not only issued by the country where that fugitive belongs to so let's say if nirav modi has committed a crime and he is an indian citizen but his crime has also affected any other country let's say for example usa then usa can direct the interpol to issue a red corner notice against the nirav modi even though he is not a us citizen also one thing which we need to keep in mind from the prelims perspective is a very important statement that interpol can not compel the law enforcement authorities in any country to arrest the subject of a red corner notice which means that if a red corner notice has been released and let's say nirav modi is having a vacation in sri lanka then interpol can not make pressure on sri lanka that no you have to arrest it is completely up to them whether they want to arrest or not at the same time interpol act only as a medium for exchange of this information and notices and does not hold a power in itself to do such arrest in any other country keep these two notices in your mind and the distinctions in your mind and we move forward to the last news of the day the gunia worm disease is in the news because the world is on the brink of a public health triumph as it closes to eradicate gunia worm disease this forms an important component of your gs2 paper under a very important theme of development and management of social sector related to health let's first try to understand what is gunia worm disease gunia worm disease is caused by a parasite or nematode which is a gunia worm which majorly infest the lower limb of a human being where it causes the blistering pain to the person affected now when this person who has been affected by this worm to get some relief that person takes his feet or limb into the water which leads to release of this nematode larvae into the water thus leading to water contamination 
Now this water is either ingested by crustaceans or copepods such as flies. Also the flies which comes and sits in our food and infect them as well. At the same time, in many rural areas or the people who comes from marginalized section who does not have access to clean water drink such infected water, the water which is infected by the larvae of the nematode. And this virus through flowing through the medium of water comes and penetrates the host stomach and intestinal wall from where over a period of time which is normally 10 to 14 months it starts developing big and big and then ultimately this female worm emerges through the skin causing excruciating pain to the host and leading to vomiting nausea as well as various kind of infections ultimately deteriorating the health of the individual. Thus, in the, from the year of 1980, there were around 3.5 million people who were affected by this gunia worm disease. However, with effective sanitation management and public awareness, over a period of time, these cases has been brought as low as to six cases in the year of 2023. As we have discussed, the cause of this gunia worm disease is a parasitic worm nematode. At the same time, it affects or the more than 90% of the infection actually take place in leg and feet as you can see in the image. A very major issue which was acting as a hurdle to remove this disease was that there is no vaccine which is available for guinea worm disease as well as there is no medication to treat the patients. Thus, country like India resorted to various campaigns of surveillance, water safety interventions and educating the people about the importance of clean water. And with all these efforts, India was finally able to eradicate guinea worm disease in the year of 2000. However, there are still several countries where this disease is still persisting. Thus, the global eradication has not yet taken place and this disease is still active in the countries such as South Sudan, Mali, Chad and Central African Republic. Thus, the prevalence of guinea worm disease reminds us about the importance of clean water and its access to the larger populace which is also a goal under the Sustainable Development Goal 6. Thus, the steps taken by India such as Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is very well in the right direction and at the same time under Jal Jeevan Mission, we should also strive to provide clean water access to the larger population. With these suggestions, we have reached to the end of the discussion today. Do not forget to attempt the questions at the end of the video and test your knowledge. We will meet in a very interesting session very soon. Till then, all the very best and thank you.